Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today, similarly sized, priced, specced, and styled steel sports watches, the entry level at Omega and Rolex versus starts now. This is the Seamaster Railmaster up against the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39. The model you see here is by any measure the Challenger as the Oyster Perpetual can claim to be the first ever sports watch. What did Omega bring to the party? Well, for 2017, the Seamaster Railmaster rolls out in a new form, 40 mil millimeters in satin finished stainless steel and I do mean all satin finished bracelet bezel case all of it even the dial is a lovely silver satin grain the watch is vintage inflected but not a pure retro play and at 40 millimeters it's an ideal size to do battle with the 39 millimeter oyster perpetual open up the clasp throw it on the wrist and you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist it's a modern men's all-arounder 40 millimeters in diameter 12.8 millimeters thick if you measure the watch lug to lug, you're going to find it is a very reasonable 46.9 millimeters. And so it does measure true lug to lug distance because there are pivoted end links. So 46.9 is the distance across the wrist. The space between the lugs, 20 millimeters, so it'll accept a universal strap size if you want to throw it on a strap. And this watch is perhaps a bit more convertible to a strap aesthetically than the Rolex. A good looking watch, I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. Let's get a little bit closer, give ourselves a bit more light and play up some of the features of the bracelet. Clearly inspired by the Rolex Oyster, nevertheless it's not a plagiarized design. As you can see there's a little bit less symmetry and more of a pronounced taper to the Oyster, whereas the Omega bracelet features relatively shorter cross-section individual links and there's very little tangible taper to this bracelet. You can see all of satin finish and every removable link is fixed by screws. There's even a half link. As you can see on each side of the clasp, the clasp is a double deployment in contrast to Rolex's single fold. Also in contrast to Rolex, Omega uses a twin trigger release system rather than a lift lock. Roll back to the case. This is a design we know well since the mid 60s. It's graced countless Seamasters and Speedmasters from Omega known as the liar style case. You have these bevels that turn outward and you have inward faces that turn inward. Satin case flanks, usually we see polish on the bevels, but here this model, lovely, stealthy and steel with all satin finish. It's the post-2017 Aquaterra case profile, so the crown is conical and a little bit wider at its outer face. There's also no shear guard profile. The dial is lovely and lush. Vertical satin finish, ecru coloration, a sort of simulated patina that adds a nice warm tone to this otherwise grayscale composition. Crosshair center, quarter arabics, railroad seconds and minutes outboard in a semi- lollipop counterweighted seconds hand. It's a good looking watch. Underneath the case back, Omega exclusive coaxial Matos chronometer, silicon hairspring, 55 hour caliber 8806, water resistant down to 850 meters. And a fun feature of this Nyad lock case back is that it always aligns perfectly top to bottom with Railmaster at the top, the Omega logo at the bottom, it never screws in sideways. A small refinement, but much appreciated. Rolling over to the Oyster Perpetual, we've known this watch in its current form since 2018 when the 114300 reference bowed with a silver white dial that you see here and also a black dial option. Throwing the watch on the wrist, it feels at first glance, eyes closed, as if it's the exact same size as the Omega. And 39 millimeters with a cushion case profile, it does look almost the same size as the Omega. The real difference is going to be in thickness, where this is 11.3 to the Omega's 12.8. And you can see that the watch has a very different shape about its case. First, lug to lug, this watch measures 47.4. And if you include the solid end links of the bracelet, these little horns that protrude on both sides, then you get a distance across the wrist of a rather substantial 49.1 millimeters. And you can really see to good effect how large this watch is. Its saving grace is its slender profile, which gives it a wonderfully slim and broad aspect ratio. So while it is large for its rated size, it is also graceful and perfectly dress compatible. 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs. This is the entry level in the Rolex catalog. $5,700 new, which means you're getting all satin finish. And you can see that's satin finish on the bracelet, not the case. So the bracelet is satin finish all the way across the tops of its links, polished on its flanks, you can see the removable links are fixed by screws, but there aren't quite as many on the Rolex. Now inside you have a polished clasp interior, which is a change from previous generations of the Oyster Perp. And you can see externally, once again, you get satin finish across the clasp as well as an embossed rather than raised and relieved Rolex crown inside. 
because it's an entry-level Rolex, you don't get the easy link system, but you do get three drilled divots, and you can see they're inside the clasp. You use a strap tool to change the anchoring point of the bracelet for fine adjustment of fit. And although it appears to be friction fit, there's the beak and the hook system, and you can see the lift lock engaging as I close it. You do have to raise the lift lock trigger to disengage, so it's just as secure as the Omega in practice. The case band is far more elegant, graceful, handsomely compound curved on its polished flank. You can see those flame-like effects of the light across the beautiful polish of this Rolex case, and Rolex comes about as close as any brand in the industry to duplicating Grand Seiko Zeratsu optically smooth mirrored finish. Now we have a twin lock crown, and it is a steel twin lock. You see the little slash underneath the Rolex crown. Screw down, 100 meters water resistant. No conical bezel here. This is the domed style bezel. And then you have that silver satin white dial, as Rolex describes it. White gold crown, white gold hands, white gold indices. It is a lovely silver mat, not quite a sunburst, more what Patek Philippe would call an opaline, with handsome square indices for maximum contrast outboard of the applique. Inside, Rolex manufacture caliber 3132, automatic winding by directional 48 hour power reserve COSC chronometer, but also superlative chronometer as Rolex attests to this watch running no worse than minus two plus two seconds per day and backs that with a five-year warranty. Again, 48-hour power reserve, stop seconds, doesn't quite have the legs of the Omega, but it is a thin and fine and tough movement that can match blows with the accuracy of the Metaz coax in the Railmaster. So let's talk about advantages. Rolex, first and foremost. This is a watch that probably is the one to buy new. Selling for $5,700, these sell used for $5,500 to about $5,900. So you could buy this watch, wear it for a year, and sell it for what you paid. History and heritage. Back in the early 1930s, the Oyster Perpetual combined Rolex's water-resistant Oyster case of the 1920s with the perpetual winding system of the early 1930s. The water resistance and automatic winding in a steel case created the progenitor of every modern sports watch, so real history and heritage. There is also the fashionista aspect, as this is a status symbol. It's a Rolex, and it's the most, well, financially appealing point of entry to the Rolex Club, which means if you want prestige and brand equity, and for some folks, the watch is a totem of status, you're going to want a Rolex. It's not for me, but it is for some. And I also have to acknowledge that this is a watch that is probably of a higher dial quality with all of appliques and the appliques themselves as well as the hands in white gold it's maybe not as interesting as the omega dial but it is materially of higher quality and more complex to assemble it's also worth mentioning that this is a thinner and more graceful watch it's especially obvious when you put the two watches crystal to crystal you can see how big and blockish the omega appears to be plus you have that attestation of accuracy. The Omega is supposed to meet the ISO 3159, which underpins the COSC. So the Omega basically is supposed to run minus four plus six or better. Whereas Rolex guarantees minus two plus two, which percentage wise is a huge leap and bound beyond what Omega guarantees. Also, not a retro watch. I appreciate that this isn't the Railmaster Trilogy, a watch that I felt was perhaps a little too retro-inflected, this watch has some retro elements. This watch has none. It's true to its history, like the Porsche 911, without ever being discontinued and then revived. So perhaps this is something like a Jaguar XKR, clearly inspired by the E-Type, but very much a modern car, whereas this right here is simply eternal. It's a Corvette, it's a 911. So let's talk about the advantages of the Omega. Value, new, this watch costs 5,200 to the 5,700 of the Rolex, which means right out of the gate, you're getting off for $500 less. But if you buy this watch used, it's about $3,500 pre-owned, which makes it a very attractive proposition. Tech, this watch has the coaxial escapement. It is a Metaz chronometer, which entails anti-magnetic testing that the Rolex could never pass, thanks to a silicon hairspring. 150 meters versus 100 meters. It may be academic, but still, capability is capability. Omega gives you more. And 55-hour power reserve versus 48 advantage Omega. Although this dial 
perhaps doesn't cost as much to fabricate, I do find it to be visually more engaging than the somewhat sterile Rolex satin with applique. This is expensive to make, but this is just a little bit warmer, a little bit more charming, and it endears itself to me more thoroughly than the Rolex. I'll also appreciate the fact that there is far less brand baggage here. You're far less likely to have someone stalk you for your watch, ask whether it's real, or try to guess its price, and I appreciate that. Also, all stealthy and steel. This is a wonderful use of full case, full bracelet satin finish. It's understated, it's handsome, and the fact that it's continued from the clasp all the way through the design of the dial makes it a remarkably full and thoroughly realized design vision. I'll also say that if you want to put one of these two watches on a strap, this is one of the Rolexes that is perhaps more amenable to strap conversion, but the Omega is built with straps in mind. There are OEM options and many 20 millimeter aftermarket choices, and this watch just looks more natural on a strap. For a lot of folks, that's a deciding factor. It's also just, well, frankly, a bit more flexible, as there are far more removable links on this bracelet than you'll find on the Rolex. The Rolex doesn't give you much in terms of adjustability, and this is a big deal in terms of finding a fit. Rolex constrains you to just a few removable links, and then the divots inside the clasp, whereas here, not only do you have a ton of links, but you have two half links, so you know you're gonna get the sizing right. At the end, which of these two do I prefer? Well, I like them both, and I might be swayed by something like a blue or red grape dial with the Rolex, but if I were pushed to really lay down my own money, I would probably opt for the Railmaster, simply because it's a bit more discreet, it's a bit more technically adept, it has a more interesting dial to my eye. It's a brand that I've already collected in the past and I would also opt for the blue dial and probably just call it a day because the blue dial version that came out in 2018 has charisma and I would even say personality that surpasses the rather sterile grayscale aesthetic of either of these examples right here. So you guys let me know, would you go for the slender elegance of the Rolex, the impeccable heritage and history, or would you go with the more discreet and technically adept Omega alternative? Let me know in the comments below. Okay, we have the Rolex in green on the right. We have the Omega in blue on the left. I think the Rolex is brighter, but Omega just gives you more loom and a bigger target. Plus, critically, the Omega looms the seconds hand, which should be obvious and obligatory on a sports-style watch. So I'm going to give the loom shot win to the Omega on that basis.